some bubbles and buttercups. The Powerpuff Girls were a cartoon powerhouse back in the late 90s to the mid 2000s easily being one of Cartoon Network's biggest box office cartoon draws. When the show first aired on the 18th November 1998, it smashed the record for any cartoon premiere at the time, and its first full season set the record for an original show, growing its audience figures and ratings week by week, with every age demographic. Wow. This comes as no surprise when you realize that the creative team behind the Powerpuff Girls also worked on beloved shows like Dexter's Laboratory, Samurai Jack, and Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends. Throughout its Powerpuff-packed six seasons, the show had an incredible cast of colorful characters. And where better to start with than the man who started it all, Professor Utonium. Hiya, neighbors! A brilliant but lonely scientist who tried to synthesize his own children after years of dedicating his life to his career. And all was going well. You know, sugar, spice, and everything nice until Chemical X. And the Powerpuff Girls were born. The Powerpuff Girls were born! Okay, wait. I've heard this somewhere before. These three keep a watchful eye over their city, the city of Townsville. And those are the Powerpuff Basics. But don't worry, there's a lot more to learn along the way. And if you're feeling super, don't forget to smash that subscribe button. Now, let's dive in and recap the Powerpuff Girls. The first episode, Monkey See Doggy Do, takes us on a sweeping tour of the city of Townsville and its citizens whilst everyone is fast asleep. Or so we think, as a mysterious figure is in the middle of stealing from the town's museum. The next morning, the museum is in chaos. So who do they call to try to save the day? The Powerpuff Girls. After a quick sweep of the area, the girls realize exactly what was stolen. Powerful, cursed ancient artifacts that when combined have unimaginable power. But who could be behind all this? That's right, Mojo Jojo. But with the Powerpuff Girls seemingly out of answers, it takes their famed Powerpuff signal to shed light on a hunch that seems barking mad. That is, until we meet the mayor of Townsville. Carol, a sick plot is underway! Everyone, including the mayor, is morphing into dogs, and some evildoer is behind it all. But before they can get the name of the culprit, the mayor conveniently fully transforms. So they seek the help of someone they trust most, the professor. Meanwhile, no one is safe from Mojo Jojo's plane of terror. Not even the narrator? The girls arrive home to find their beloved professor has been struck with the canine curse, but he's trying to tell them something. Puppy! After a few attempts of trying to get it out of him, the girls finally get their name and race off at the speed of light to confront the maniacal Mojo Jojo. But it seems like the girls are too late. As they arrive, his super weapon fires, changing the Powerpuff Girls and the rest of the world into his dog minions. It looks all but certain that in his first ever appearance, Mojo Jojo will complete his plan for world domination, but not without some useful exposition. After hearing this information, the now Powerpuff Pups hatch a plan to break the Anubis head. Buttercup takes advantage of Mojo Jojo's smug premature celebration by ambushing him from behind and biting him, causing the artifact to be launched into the air in panic and pain, only to come crashing down on top of Mojo Jojo's head, shattering into a thousand pieces, and in turn transforms everyone back into humans. But because he smashed the cursed Anubis head, Mojo Jojo is forced to live the rest of his days as a dog. But I'm not sure this will be the last time we see Mojo Jojo. The second half of the first episode of the series is titled Mommy Fearest, and starts off a little more innocently than the name suggests. The ever-caring professor puts his girls to bed, before revealing just how tired and lonely he really is. As fate would have it though, the very next day, after getting distracted by the girls, Professor Utonium accidentally crashes his shopping cart into a stranger. But this isn't any ordinary stranger. This is… I'm a good lady? A little on the nose, but the professor has taken an instant shine to her. Perhaps if you're not too busy, maybe he could take you out? And what's better, she seems to like him too. This professor is one smooth operator. Or incredibly lucky. Either way, he's got himself a date. Fast forwarding to the big day, the mayor is on babysitting duties, whilst the professor is away. Nice to see him with his own body, isn't it? And yes, he is that small. The professor returns, but not alone, as Ima has tagged along and wants to talk to the girls by herself, where she explodes at them for seemingly no reason. It seems she's I'm a good lady by name and not by nature. After living in their house for a day, 
Aima bans the girls from using any superpowers and forces them to clean the entire house from top to bottom. As soon as they're done, the girls want to spend some of that nice family time with their professor, but Aima forces the girls to go to bed. But the girls are called into action in the dead of night, and when they return, Aima is waiting to ground them. Now, I know what you're thinking. How can you ground three supergirls who can fly and travel at light speed? Well, let's not get caught up in the technicalities. But it seems I'm a good lady may not be who she says she is. Shocking, I know. As she tiptoes out of the house in the middle of the night, and coincidentally, I'm sure, the girl's emergency phone rings. It's the mayor. He tells the girls that his jewels are being stolen as he speaks by none other than Sedusa, the first appearance of the known menace to the Powerpuff Girls, a temptress who uses her looks and hair as weapons. Putting the pieces together, Blossom and the girls realize what's been going on all along and wait for Sedusa, or should I say I'm a good lady, to return and they reveal her true identity once and for all. They go toe-to-toe -to -toe in a fight for the ages, which is stopped when the professor returns home, to find a desperate Sedusa trying to persuade him that it was the girls who turned on her, and they're out of control. For a second, it seems like the professor falls for her trap, but he traps her, calling the police and getting Sedusa locked up for the rest of her days. The episode Octa Evil starts with girls tackling a three-headed dragon, which is trying to demolish Townsville. They make short work of the fire-breathing menace, but it's quickly revealed that the girls are being watched by one of the most memorable and most powerful villains in the entire show. So villainous. Of his name strikes fear into the hearts of men. Him is basically the devil. If he had lobster claws and elf ears, him is furious because his monster has been defeated by the Powerpuff Girls. He has those fits of rage every so often, so get used to that. The girls, meanwhile, tidy up their mess and in doing so damage the mayor's office, causing a fight to break out between Blossom and Buttercup. Bubbles, on the other hand, hates confrontation and gets upset at her sister's fighting, much to the pleasure of him. How do you let the Powerpuff Girls humiliate you? Is his voice just as unsettling for you as it is for me? Ugh. The bickering between Blossom and Buttercup continues back at home, leaving Bubbles alone in their room, still upset over her sister's arguing, but not as alone as she first thought. Because her favorite stuffed animal, Octi, starts talking to her. Um, closer so I can tell you. Enticing Bubbles closer, him slowly brainwashes her through Octi about her sisters, trying to get Bubbles to turn them against each other. Bubbles tells Buttercup not to listen to Blossom and to do her own thing, which does end up defeating the monster, but also ends with an innocent old lady being crushed by it. This causes an even bigger argument between Blossom and Buttercup, proving Octi and him right. Seeing his master plan falling into place, a giddy him teleports to the girls' room, morphing into Octi telling Bubbles how stupid she is for falling for his plan. With her sisters nowhere to be found, Bubbles is the only one who can stop him from destroying Townsville and conquering the world. But things don't quite go to plan, as Bubbles is snatched mid-air by him and in doing so, screams. Bubbles is in trouble! A scream which can be heard by Blossom and Buttercup. The two girls rush to the aid of their sister in need but tensions rise between them again before another scream from their sister snaps them back to the job at hand, saving her instantly. Him, however, doesn't put up a fight, as he knows in his current form he's no match for three Powerpuff Girls. The girls settle their differences, and once again, the day is saved. They're nothing like him. Yes, I'm talking about the debut of the Amoeba Boys. Boss Man, Slim, and Junior are slimy, gelatinous, well, life-size amoebas, and an all-around annoyance to the city of Townsville. Quick little fun fact. The Amoeba Boys are one of the girls' oldest foes, appearing in their very, very early shorts even before the show was called The Powerpuff Girls. But enough about the past, let's bring you to the present. The episode starts with the Amoeba Boys trying to pull off one of their most creatively genius schemes to date, stealing in orange, which they forgot to do. The pathetic pathogens dream of being real criminals. They call the girls and attempt another crime, only this time far, far worse, littering. This doesn't interest the girls, though, who leave the boys in a slimy slump. That is, before stumbling on what could be the crime of the century, standing on grass with a keep off sign. The unthreatening three stand on the grass for what seems like an eternity, through rain and cold weather, and the germs end up getting a cold. Now that's ironic. Their virus spreads through Townsville, infecting every citizen that comes into contact with it. Nobody is safe, not even the mayor, so he calls the Powerpuff to get to the bottom of this viral mystery. The girls fly through Townsville to get a closer look at the outbreak, and more importantly, help the city. 
Whilst the girls are trying to help, the Amoeba Boys annoy them to the point Buttercup explodes at them, telling them that they're the most pathetic criminals to ever step foot in the city and to never show their faces in Townsville ever again. The girls head home when they start to feel under the weather, hoping the professor has some sort of scientific remedy. But when they arrive, they find he too has fallen ill and that the virus they have is a new strain that is very hard to treat. But when the professor shows them under the microscope, it reveals the Amoeba Boys. The professor tells the girls that it was probably the Amoeba Boys that started all of this, so our sickly superheroes zoom off to find them. The girls finally find the trio and ask them to come back to their house, telling them that they could be the worst criminals in the history of Townsville. The boys leap at the chance and say they won't go down without a fight, a fight that lasts all of eight seconds. The girls take them back to the professor who creates an antidote and cures everyone in Townsville, suddenly turning the Amoeba Boys from zeros to heroes. Told you you should have taken the orange! In the episode Fuzzy Logic, the girls come face to face with one of their most unique foes, Fuzzy Lumpkins, a grumpy and reclusive hillbilly-style character. No one really knows what Fuzzy is, maybe some purple bear, insect, human thing. Anyway, what we do know about Mr. Lumpkins is that he hates anyone or anything being on his property. A sleeping Fuzzy is woken up by a squirrel. Yep, you guessed it, on his property. So he takes his boomstick, which is an amazing name by the way, and tries to hunt down the squirrel, leading Fuzzy on a wild squirrel chase that leads him to Townsville and directly into oncoming traffic. A hurt, lost, and furious Fuzzy takes out his rage on Townsville. Clearly having taken a big bump to the head, Fuzzy accuses everyone and everything of being on his property and destroys the town in the process. Meanwhile, in another part of town, the Powerpuff Girls are in their kindergarten class having some harmless fun. When the mayor's emergency telephone rings, alarming them of the chaos in the middle of Townsville. But when the girls arrive, the place is a ghost town and those that are there are speaking gibberish, unable to tell them who committed the crime. That is, until Bubbles notices our furry friend from earlier, Mr. Squirrel. Bubbles is the only Powerpuff Girl with the ability to speak to animals. Using the information and the directions from Mr. Squirrel, the girls launch an all-action attack on the home of Fuzzy Lumpkins, which sends them loopy. Mr. Squirrel tells the girls of Fuzzy's love for his banjo, Joe. They really love using confusing names in this show, don't they? They use this against him, threatening to burn the instrument unless he slowly approaches Buttercup, and when he does, she thumps him over the head. The girls arrest him and Fuzzy is left to spend the rest of his days in jail. My property! Season 1's Boogie Frights is one of the most beloved episodes of the entire show, with one of the most memorable one-off villains in any cartoon. The episode starts once again with bedtime for the city of Townsville, and like the rest of the city, the Powerpuff Girls are about to hit the hay. But Bubbles is afraid of the dark so she can't sleep. Buttercup hears this and tells Bubbles about the boogeyman under the bed, scaring her and Blossom. The girls finally go to bed after a chat with the professor, and it's revealed under their bed there is a real monster. This monster isn't any normal monster though, he's the boogeyman. The boogeyman is an evil disco and darkness loving villain, and his master plan is to change forever how he and his monster friends live as they can only come out at night, but any form of light will destroy them. So with the help of one of his minions, the Boogeyman cuts all of Townsville's power, allowing the monsters to come out and play. The night doesn't last forever though, and when the Boogeyman turns up, it seems he's too late as the sun is about to rise, hearing his friends about to leave. The Boogeyman tells them that this is just the start and reminds them of his master plan, a giant disco ball that blocks out the sun. With the town plunged into everlasting darkness, the monsters can cause havoc terrorizing everyone in Townsville. The girls are woken up by the Boogeyman's Grandmaster plan and fly immediately to the scene of the crime. But the longer the Boogeyman and his crew spend in darkness, the stronger they are. The girls recognize this, so head for the disco ball instead. The girls know they have to destroy the ball, but an angry Boogeyman is on their tail. Blossom and Buttercup manage to take out the Boogeyman whilst Bubbles destroys the disco ball, leaving the monsters to melt in the morning light. The episode Telephonies centers around a group of the Powerpuff Girls' most hideous villains, the Gang Green Gang, a bunch of troublemaking hoodlums with a sickly green complexion. The group is made up of five members, Ace, Snake, Little Arturo, Grubber, and Big Billy. In this episode, the five are obsessed with prank calling anyone and everyone, but pranking random people soon becomes boring and small time for them, so they decide to infiltrate the mayor's office to use and abuse his emergency line to the Powerpuff Girls. Thanks to Grubber and his impressions, the gang managed to fool the Powerpuff Girls into thinking numerous villains are destroying Townsville. The girls track down each villain, Mojo Jojo, Fuzzy Lumpkins, and even him. 
His voice still sends a shiver down my spine. The girls demand to know what evil plans they've got in store, but each villain has nothing, leaving the girls puzzled and the villains even more confused. So much so, they call one another. Yep, it's a villain crossover episode. The three decide they're going to complain about the Powerpuff Girls' behavior, and they are still citizens of Townsville. And where do they call to make the complaint? The mayor's office. Big Billy tells him all about their plan and what they've been doing. So, the villains all join up in breaking into the mayor's office to teach the Gang Green Gang a lesson. The mayor returns to see this and instantly calls the girls, asking them to fly down and stop the madness in his office. But the girls, having heard of this all before, assuming it's another prank call, they hang up and go to bed. So technically, for the first time ever, the villains save the day in this episode. They're very funny. The episode Mr. Mojo's Rising brings Mojo Jojo back as our evil star, starting by showing us exactly where the girls were born, Professor Utonium's laboratory, setting the scene for the professor spending most of his days there. But that's quickly interrupted as we see him getting kidnapped by an unknown figure. The girls come bursting into the lab because Buttercup and Bubbles are fighting, but the professor is nowhere to be seen. The girls search the lab for clues and find a note that's written by none other than Mojo Jojo with the information they need. The girls speed off to Mojo Jojo's lair to rescue the professor, but when they arrive, Mojo Jojo reveals that the professor is his father? He tells the girls he wasn't born this way, and blames the professor for the way he is. As before the girls came along, he was the professor's assistant, Jojo. But when the professor accidentally created the girls, the blast of Chemical X turned Jojo from a lab assistant into a genetically mutated genius. And with the girls now taking all of the professor's attention, Jojo's only choice was to channel his new intellect into a life of trying to destroy the Powerpuff Girls, creating his evil identity, Mojo Jojo. The girls quarry to the professor, but his lack of memory only makes things worse, angering Mojo who demands he is given the powers that the girls have, and the professor agrees. Utonium and Mojo work tirelessly to create a machine to copy the girl's powers onto Mojo. Upon having powers copied into himself, Mojo betrays the professor and quickly outmatches the girls, using all their own strengths against them. Along with his improved brain power, after dispatching the girls, he plans to use his new powers to rule the world. Seeing Mojo cause chaos unlocks the professor's memory, and reveals that Mojo was the worst lab assistant he'd ever had. But not just that. Mojo was the reason why the Powerpuff Girls were born. He pushed the professor into the glass tube containing Chemical X. Whilst reliving his past and in shock over the fact he brought around the creation of the Powerpuff Girls, the girls remove all of his powers, leaving him in his lair muttering to himself for what he's just been told. Now that's what I call monkey business. <laughs> The episode Bear Facts is renowned for being one of the more interesting episodes of the series when it comes to storytelling, as it's told through the perspective of the mayor. To kick things off, we see the mayor completing some of his duties, needing the help of his secretary, Miss Bellum, to spell the word mayor. Our not-so-favorite monkey menace, Mojo Jojo, breaks into his office and kidnaps him. The mayor is blindfolded, as Mojo Jojo tells him his plan to strip off his title and become the mayor of Townsville to eventually rule the world. Oh, where am I? But before he can put that plan into action, the Powerpuff Girls gatecrash his lair, defeating Mojo and saving the blindfolded mayor. They take him back to the office, and the mayor thanks them, but they giggle at him as he talks. He asks the girls what happened, as his memory is a bit foggy and he doesn't understand what's so funny. The girls tell him that it's a long story. <laughs> well, you don't want to hear it. It's such a long story. But a persistent mayor tells them to spill the beans, so they do. The girls start to argue about exactly what happened, from the color of the flowers Bubbles drew at school to Blossom bragging about learning another language. The girls finally decide that Miss Bellum called them whilst at kindergarten, telling them that the mayor had been kidnapped because she found a note supposedly written by him saying that he'd gone home to write an election speech, which is impossible because she writes all of his speeches. This just confuses the mayor further until an angered buttercup blurts out exactly what happened, but without the detail of what was so funny. The girls continued to confuse each other, and the audience, with their conflicting stories, telling the mayor how they defeated Mojo Jojo while skirting around the topic of why they're laughing. So, the mayor loses it, and demands to know, but the girls scramble and leave his office without saying, Words don't do justice to what happens next. Cheeky. Our next episode, The Rowdy Rough Boys, is the first episode of the show to be over 20 minutes long. 
doubling the 11 minute runtime of the rest of the series so far. Is it even a Powerpuff Girls episode without Mojo Jojo wreaking havoc on the city of Townsville? Well, that's where this one starts. Mojo goes on multiple sprees of chaos, using laser cannons, mech suits, and other nefarious inventions. But don't worry, the girls are on hand each time to dispatch the villain in double quick time, landing him in jail. The constant defeat at the hands of the Powerpuff Girls eats away at Mojo Jojo, sending him slightly mad as he schemes a way to get back at them which leads him to call the professor. Mojo pretends he's a college kid doing a report on the girls, and asks Utonium what exactly it is they're made of. Yeah, I know five episodes ago he was a lab assistant at the birth of the Powerpuff Girls, but this is a cartoon. The professor gladly tells him the entire recipe for them, but Mojo finds it a little bit too girly. Wanting something tougher, Mojo decides to trade sugar, spice, and everything nice for snips, snails, and puppy dog tails. But he's missing the critical ingredient, Chemical X. That is, until he notices his prison cell toilet, and once he inspects it, he realizes that it carries the same chemical potency needed to bring his creations to life. With his ingredients collected and his makeshift mixing bowl prepared, Mojo starts the process, and the Rowdy Rough Boys are born. Brick, Boomer, and Butch are the evil male counterparts of the Powerpuff Girls. Mojo gives them a quick briefing about how good and heroic the Powerpuff Girls are, and how they must be stopped. So, the boys grab Mojo, bust out of prison, and head directly for the Powerpuff Girls. The girls, meanwhile, are busy saving the town from yet another monster when the Rowdy Rough Boys appear. They don't waste any time before going straight for the girls. The two trios, though, are evenly matched to the annoyance of the Rowdy Rough Boys, who decide to combine their powers to create a super weapon to destroy the Powerpuff Girls for good, thinking they've won. The boys zoom off back to Mojo Jojo's lair, but all is not lost as the girls survived. The girls tell the citizens of Townsville that they can't protect them anymore, and that they'll need to find better superheroes. That is, until Miss Sarah Bellum pipes up and tells them that maybe they're attacking the boys the wrong way. That little boys are scared of girls being nice? So instead of fighting the boys, they should kill them with kindness. A little outdated, maybe, but it's a cartoon after all. The girls waste no time and head straight for the Rowdy Rough Boys. Using their girlish grace, they shock the boys with a kiss, frightening them to death. Literally, Snips, Snails, and Puppy Dog Tails ran over Mojo Jojo as the Powerpuff Girls yet again foil one of his grandmaster plans. Season 2's opener, Stuck Up, Up, and Away, starts with a limousine pulling up outside the girls' kindergarten class, with a new kid about to be dropped off, a new, very rich, very spoiled kid, as her dad drops her a wad of cash for milk money. Miss Keene, the kindergarten teacher, introduces the new girl to the class, revealing her name to be Princess Morbucks, which, to be fair, is right on the money. Get it? The spoiled princess refuses to play with her new classmates because she's used to the best of the best, actual buildings being built for her, traveling first class, generally turning her nose up at everything like a snobby kid would. After a near accident involving the class's hamster, where the Powerpuff Girls are on hand to save the day, Princess becomes intrigued by the girls and tells everyone that she wants to be a Powerpuff Girl. We all know that's impossible, but Princess won't take no for an answer and tells the girls that her rich daddy will buy her exactly what she needs to become a Powerpuff Girl. After school, Princess does what a spoiled brat does, goes and throws a tantrum to her rich father, getting a small fortune to spend on powers. Princess arrives at class the next day, fully kitted out with a top-of-the-range superhero suit with state-of-the-art weaponry. This doesn't ruffle the Powerpuff Girls' feathers, though, as the mayor's emergency line rings for them to head to Townsville as there's a bank robbery ongoing. The girls are about to tackle the criminals when the self-proclaimed Powerpuff Princess appears and makes a total mess of the fight, allowing the criminals to get away and nearly causing an explosion. The girls tell Princess once again how dangerous the game of crime fighting is, and to leave it to them as she can never be a Powerpuff Girl. But what does Princess do? Goes and cries to her daddy. With a briefcase full of cash, Princess upgrades her super suit and challenges the Powerpuff Girls to a battle, which she wins? Princess takes care of Bubbles and Buttercup with her new suit, but when the trio combine their powers, Princess Morbucks is soon defeated and told she will never, ever be a Powerpuff Girl. Now that is the real price you pay for being a spoiled brat.
In the episode Supper Villain, we see an average family neighbor of the Powerpuff Girls, the Smiths, seeing them live their normal family life, eating breakfast, working, coming home from work, the boring stuff. But it's soon apparent that Mr. Smith doesn't like living next door to the perfect professor and his perfect Powerpuff Girls. And as luck would have it, the Powerpuff Girls are over playing with Mr. Smith's daughter. The TV in the house showcases a news bulletin, stating that Mojo Jojo has the mayor hostage, so the girls fly off to save the day. All the while, Mr. Smith listens closely to just how evil Mojo Jojo is, almost wanting him to succeed, getting enjoyment out of evil. Eh, we all knew a dad like that. We see the suspicious Smith go through his boring routine, only to return to the TV where the hostage triangle between the mayor, Mojo Jojo, and the Powerpuff Girls still plays out. And after a huge explosion, Mojo Jojo has been defeated and the mayor is safe, to the annoyance of Mr. Smith. Mrs. Smith tells him that they're having some special dinner guests over. And, you guessed it, it's the Professor and the Powerpuff Girls. A sweaty, nervous Mr. Smith tries to convince his wife that now isn't the best time to have them over. His wife puts him in his place, and they all sit down for some relaxation, where talk of the battle between the girls and Mojo Jojo starts. But Mr. Smith is clearly uncomfortable about this topic and excuses himself entirely. Either he's really afraid of monkeys, or maybe, just maybe, he's evil! He reappears as not just Harold Smith, but as super villain Harold Smith. Wow, creative. After a life of monotony, Harold decides to show himself as the arch villain he's always dreamt of being. The stakes soon rise as super villain Her you know what, I don't care, I'm calling him Harold. As Harold threatens to melt the professor's head with his hair dryer. I mean, ray gun. Mrs. Smith steps in and demands that everyone sits at the table and eats their dinner as she's worked too hard to let it all go to waste. The professor takes his sweet time eating his dinner as he knows that Harold is waiting to pounce as soon as the last mouthful has been swallowed. But Mrs. Smith has made dessert and it's coconut cream pie. Harold tells everyone how much he loves those pies, which cues Blossom to throw one right at him. This starts a mega food fight between everyone, but it soon stopped as the police break down the door after receiving a complaint. They arrest Harold for carrying a gun, hair dryer, ray gun thing, and all is well. I guess sometimes a boring life is a good one. Those sour puff girls ruin my dinner! In the episode Speed Demon, the girls are heading home for the day after school when they decide to challenge each other to see who can get home the fastest. The girls, being distracted by wanting to win, accidentally fly so fast that they start to travel forward in time, in the far-off future, where everything is much, much older, including the professor. After decades without seeing his girls, a confused professor thinks his mind is playing tricks on him and chases the girls out of the house. The girls, now confused and homeless, travel around Townsville until they land at the mayor's office, finding it totally destroyed with a crazed and delusional Miss Bellum inside muttering to herself about the Powerpuff Girls not showing up when the town needed them most. The girls continue their tour of Townsville and go back to school to find Miss Keene, standing exactly where she was when they left, still waving. For a kid's cartoon, this is actually really dark. It's been a full 50 years since the girls have left school, and in that time, someone has taken over Townsville. And that someone is him. Yes! As you race through time, the whole world... He tells the girls that their race caused their time to slow, whilst everyone else sped up, and it's their fault their city is in ruin. With 50 years to grow, Him's form is much stronger than what we saw in Season 1, allowing him to transform into his true self. Instead of battling with the girls, him reintroduces the girls with the entire city, and the citizens in their zombie-like state chant that this is all the Powerpuff Girls' fault. The girls, in desperation, fly up to space to get away from them and zoom back down, traveling as fast as they did to go into the future, bringing them back to the present. And once again, the day, oh, uh, I mean the future, is saved. Oh my gosh, we were just talking about you. Where are you? Over here. Oh. The episode Town and Out is another one of the most controversial episodes of the series. A lot of hardcore fans hate it, and we're about to find out why. The professor and the girls are moving to a new home after he accepted a new job in a place called Citiesville, a much larger, more industrial city than Townsville, with greater scientific facilities. The home they move into is a motel, and not your average motel. A grimy, horrible, oh no, wait, no, that's an average motel. 
The girls have a miserable day in school, and even when Citysville descends into chaos, their new teacher makes things worse by not letting them help. The girls return home to complain to the professor, but before they can, he tells them just how much he loves the place. Not wanting to burst his bubble, the girls lie about loving the city too, and try to make the best of a bad situation by going to Cityville's mayor to smooth things over. The mayor doesn't take the girls seriously though, and continues to complete his duties. He gets a call from the chief of police about a bank robbery, and the girls waste no time in heading down to the scene of the crime. The girls tackle the criminals and capture them, but in doing so, damage the city's bridge, leaving the citizens more angry than thankful. Talk about being ungrateful! The girls once again return home to find a gleeful professor loving city life, but a call from the mayor of Citysville drags them back up to his office. The mayor scolds the girls over their behavior, as the money stolen by the criminals was only $400, and the bridge they blew up was $4 million, a historic landmark now destroyed by the Powerpuff Girls. So the mayor passes them a bill that states they can never use their powers whilst in Citysville. The girls return home for a final time to tell the professor how much they hate Citysville. And guess what? He hates it too! This entire time, he was just pretending for the sake of the girls, and they all agree to go home, to the city of Townsville. Now what haven't we had for a while? A villain crossover episode. Well, good things come to those who wait, as Season 3's The Beat Alls is just that. Four of Townsville's most evil villains are all reminiscing about their fights with the Powerpuff Girls. Mojo Jojo, Princess Morbucks, Fuzzy Lumpkins, and Gulp him. The four decide that today is the day the Powerpuff Girls are finally destroyed, so they head for the girls' house. But an argument breaks out between them all about who gets to go head-to-head -head with the Powerpuff Girls. Now at the house, the four combine all their powers and launch an attack on the girls, which ends with Fuzzy throwing his large rock on top of the girls, defeating them. Shocked that they finally achieved their ultimate goal, the four decide to team up permanently to create a super evil alliance known as the Beatles. Now, where have I heard that before? Well, after their hard day's night, the Beatles create mania in Townsville, landing hit after hit to the Powerpuff Girls. Their brutish invasion shows no signs of stopping defeating the girls time and time again to the point that they stop showing up entirely. With an evil ticket to ri- Okay, alright, I'll stop, the jig is up. This is obviously a Beatles parody, which makes sense as the girls really need help. Sorry, that was the last one. The girls, meanwhile, are left to sit in their sadness after not being able to beat the fearsome four, watching endless news shows and reading articles about just how powerless they've become. The professor tells the girls that yesterday all their troubles seemed so far away. Wait a minute, wait, he's worse than I am! Despite his musical puns, the professor tries to make the girls see they can beat the Beatles by turning them against each other. But honestly, it seems that the Beatles are about to do a better job of that themselves. When robbing the Townsville Bank, Mojo Jojo meets a new lady friend, Moko Ono. I have to ask, why did they make this? No kid would understand all these references, but I'm glad they did. Moko drives a wedge between Mojo and the rest of the Beatles. Imagine that. Him, Princess, and Fuzzy decide to ditch Mojo and get back to business, causing crime. But three isn't as strong as four, as when they face the Powerpuff Girls again, justice gets served. With one member left, the girls race for Mojo, and with the help of a monkey handler, separate Mojo and Moko, taking him to finally reform the Beatles in prison. Season 4's opener, Him Diddle Riddle, sees a return to the feature-length format of the show, and starts with the girls deep in thought after being given just two minutes to save Townsville. But to do so, they've got to solve a riddle. Although it's less of a riddle and more of a humongous monster. But either way, it's about to destroy the city. The girls quickly defeat the multi-eyed menace, only to be met with the news that this monster wasn't the answer. It was a distraction. And to be fair, I fell for it. The answer, actually, is a school bus, because that too is yellow and has 66 eyes, with everyone inside it. The girls manage to stop the bus from falling to its doom with less than three seconds to spare, but their celebration comes to a shuddering halt when a familiarly evil voice appears. The voice of him. Him tells the girls that this is the first of nine riddles he set out for them, one down to go. Each will be more dangerous than the last, but there's two catches. They must be completed within the time given, and any correct answers and the professor will pay. Him disappears back to his realm, but before he does, he leaves the riddle. You've brought joy to the people for so many years. Now to their eyes, you must bring tears. The girls have two minutes to solve the riddle, so they travel through town thinking of ways to make as many people cry as possible, but soon realize the quickest way is to make it rain, as the raindrops will count as makeshift tears. Him appears to congratulate them and to give them their third riddle, but to find out exactly 
exactly what. They need to get across town without flying to answer a payphone in only three minutes. They get there with only seconds to spare and are given their next riddle by a payphone formed him who asks the girls an impossibly complicated scientific-based math question, a question which the professor would excel in. But they choose brawn over brains, and good thing too, as the question was literally about two trains that were going to collide. And of course, him is there to give them another brain-teasing riddle. A riddle we don't actually see, unfortunately, but they get it right. Guessing him's favorite ice cream flavor. I bet it's something disgusting like charcoal or pistachio. It seems it's not just the professor that him has captured, as he's kidnapped and cloned their beloved kindergarten teacher, Miss Keen, and the only way to save her is to find out which one is really her. Blossom asks, who will the other Miss Keen say is the real Miss Keen? And I can't lie, I have spent an hour trying to figure this next bit out, and well, take it away, Blossom. Everyone got that? Great. Me either. But she was right. On to the next riddle. Wait, SATs? The girls have to score 100 points in one minute, which to be fair is how most of my tests feel like. Through sheer dumb luck, the girls pass which again is how most of my tests went too. Anyway, a furious him unleashes their next riddle. They must get rid of a bigger monster, but this time, no superpowers. With time ticking, the girls try different methods of defeating their massive monster, but each attempt fails. That is, until they realize they can literally get rid of the monster by sending him to the airport, just about completing the riddle. With one riddle standing between them and their professor, him tells the girls, you will find your professor if you solve this last rhyme. Where is boiling and freezing at the same time? Him gives them 30 seconds to wrap their heads around this riddle, but thanks to the mayor, they don't have to. He explains that the riddle is coordinates. The boiling point and freezing point of water go together to pinpoint a place in Townsville. How clever! I mean, he couldn't spell mayor in season one. What happened? Did he go to grad school? With the mayor's information, the girls flash towards where they think him is, only to pick the wrong side of the street. Out of time, the girls barge through the diner door, but it seems like the professor will pay for his breakfast. Fist. It turns out, this entire wild goose chase was all because the professor had a bet with him that his girls could solve all of his riddles, and if they could, he would get a free breakfast. All that stress, all that panic, for some free bacon, egg, and cheese? This sums up how we all feel. The episode The Boys Are Back In Town starts as any other episode would, with highlights of the girls crushing crime in the city of Townsville. But these highlights aren't just being watched by us. They're also being watched by him. I think you all know I love saying it all spooky and scared like that. His infernal majesty, him, has ripped apart the fabric of time to view each and every moment one of his criminal colleagues has gone up against the Powerpuff Girls and lost, trying to pinpoint exactly how to defeat them once and for all, hoping he'd find the right villain or villains to mold into the perfect Powerpuff destroying machine. Meanwhile, in Townsville, the girls are dealing with yet another menacing monster, or should I say monsters, when suddenly the ground starts trembling breaking and rising to reveal the return of three tiny titans of terror, the Rowdy Rough Boys. The girls, however, don't take them seriously as they've defeated them with a simple kiss way back in Season 1. But Brick, Boomer, and Butch have been infused with the power of him, and anything the girls used before won't work against the new and improved Rowdy Rough Boys. The girls try to tackle their opposite trio, but for every question, the boys have all the answers. And it turns out that not only does their old way of defeating them not work, it makes them stronger. The girls, now tiny, are easy pickings for the boys. No, girls. He tells the girls that he realized that the boys had only one weakness, and if he could fix it, they'd be a perfect match. But not only did he fix it, he turned that weakness into a strength. Him leaves, allowing the boys to outmuscle the girls, beating them at every corner. The girls retreat to regroup to try and form some sort of winning plan, but the boys find them and turn them into pawns in a game known as Ultimate Fight Original. With the girls down and out, nothing likely to help them, help finds its way in from an unlikely source. Butch bites his tongue thanks to a pot shot from Buttercup, causing the other boys to laugh at him, making them shrink. The girls see this and decide to cause the boys to laugh at each other as much as they can until they shrink back down to size, bite size. But before the final blow can land, him reappears to tell the Powerpuff Girls that they may have won this one, but they're lucky. I guess they were lucky the other 59,684 times. Talk about a sore loser. Statistically, they're crushing it. See me, feel me, know me. 
is probably the most unique episode of the entire series, as for a full 20 minutes, the show turns into a rock opera. It has to be said for this episode that you've got to watch it yourself to get the most enjoyment out of it, as the songs are the star of the show. But for a quick recap, the girls are fighting against all their familiar foes. But everyday superheroing is a thankless, tiring task. And for once, the girls just want to be left alone in peace. A magical gnome soon appears and offers them a deal. He will rid the world of evil and grant them peace, but they must give up their superpowers. They agree, finally becoming normal girls. And the city of Townsville become a peace-filled utopia where everyone worships the gnome. The girls tell the professor about their deal, and he warns them that whilst there is no active evil, the gnome isn't to be trusted for stealing Townsville's free will. But soon, after the gnome becomes fully evil, breaking the binding laws of his magic spell and accidentally restoring the Powerpuff Girls to full power, they go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the magical gnome, ending with him falling into oblivion and the world being restored to the way it was. But honestly, go and watch this episode, it's excellent. The episode Octagon is, you guessed it, another Octi episode. But sadly, it's also the last episode of the show too. We got here fast, didn't we? The episode starts in the middle of the professor trying to put together a huge buffet for a very important party, asking the girls to be on their best behavior. But Bubbles is nowhere to be seen. It turns out she's still getting ready and looking for her favorite stuffed animal, Octi. She sees a leg of his sticking out from under the bed, but when she pulls him out, it's only the leg that's there. A distraught Bubbles becomes hell-bent on not only finding the rest of Octi, but getting revenge on the person who hurt him. She goes through party guests one by one, trying to piece together who could have done such a thing to her favorite toy, from Buttercup all the way to Miss Keen. A confused and frankly mentally unwell Bubbles is out of ideas, so she locks everyone in their house until the person who killed Octi gives him back to her. But at the height of her delusion, the house phone rings. Mojo Jojo is on the other end. Honestly, who else but Mojo? He wants over 1,000 gallons of Chemical X in return for the Octi doll. The professor refuses to meet Mojo's demands, telling everyone that it was him who killed Octi. When cleaning for the party, the professor accidentally ran Octi over with a vacuum cleaner, burning him to a crisp. But he tries his best to fix him up in his lab, before realizing Octi was missing a leg. So he tiptoed back to the scene of the crime, but found Bubbles in her room holding the missing leg. He was too late. The professor produces Octi from his pocket and fixes him for Bubbles. But what about Mojo Jojo's call? Well, the professor asked the operator to track down where the call was being made from, and it turns out the call was made from inside the house. But it turns out Mojo is just bluffing while sitting on the toilet eating banana cream pie? Okay, the show kind of lost its way towards the end. Well, it seems the banana cream pie was contaminated, giving Mojo the mother of all bad stomachs. It seems he picked the best place to sit. With that, for the final time. The day is saved, bringing a close to the series. But that wasn't it for the Powerpuff Girls, as there was also a movie that was released alongside it, which I'll obviously recap. In 2002, riding the wave of the popularity of the Powerpuff Girls, Cartoon Network released a 73-minute epic version of the show. The movie isn't quite what you'd expect, however, as instead of following the girls as we know them, it starts from the beginning, from their creation through the eyes of the professor allowing us to see the wholesome moments, like when he finally realizes he's no longer alone and is finally the father he always wanted to be. To be honest, this movie is kind of like a streamlined version of events for the Powerpuff Girls, almost like a recap in and of itself, but adding a few interesting details. Don't worry, I'll get to them. On the girls' very first day of kindergarten, they play a game of tag that goes horribly wrong, because they still don't understand their own strength and end up destroying things at school, making everyone hate them. So on their way home, they meet our favorite sickly green gang, the Gangrene Gang, who are stopped from attacking the girls by none other than Jojo. Now thanks to season 1, we know who Jojo really is and what he's planning. But what we didn't know is that he and the girls team up to help build what will eventually be Mojo Jojo's observatory lair. For helping him, Jojo sneaks the girls into Townsville Zoo, but all the while planting tiny teleportation ships on the monkeys, apes, and gorillas behind the girls' back. The professor, meanwhile, is facing uproar over the creation of the girls. During the very next night, Jojo activates his chips, bringing his army of apes to him where he mutates them with stolen chemical X into super intelligent primates just like him, transforming himself into Mojo Jojo. The girls are soon attacked by Mojo and his army, and announces to the town that he couldn't have done all of this without the help of the girls. 
angering the citizens to the point where even the professor turns on the girls, leaving them to blast off into space, hoping their evil ways won't affect Townsville anymore. Of course, that leaves Mojo to announce that he's now the ruler of the world and king of primates. But with all the Chemical X-infused brains, each ape is a genius in their own right, wanting to become king and ruler themselves. A dejected Mojo then tries to destroy the heartbroken professor, but the girls hear his choked cry and figure they have nothing left to lose and must save him and Townsville. The girls make easy work of the ape army when they realize they can use their superpowers as a force for good. Finally! Mojo then kidnaps the professor as a shield from the girls. But when Mojo meets the girls again, he is in the middle of pumping himself with so much Chemical X that he grows into a super giant mutant monkey and tries to get the girls to join him one last time. But before things can really get heated, the professor appears with the antidote for Chemical X, which smashes as Mojo falls towards the professor, landing him in the concoction and bringing him back down to size. The professor hugs the girls, everyone apologizes to each other but decides it's best with what's left of the antidote to remove their powers. That is, until Miss Bellum appears, apologizing on behalf of the mayor and the city of Townsville, asking the girls to be their local superheroes. And technically, for the first time ever, the day is saved. Okay, so now that is a full recap of the Powerpuff Girls. What about the 2016 reboot, I hear you ask? Uh, no. No, you didn't ask that, actually, because no one would ask that. But seriously, thank you all so much for watching. And let us know down below what show you'd like to see next. It's honestly really helpful, and I'd love to hear from you. See you next time. Bye-bye.